today. We may have a few folks joining us as uh, we progress, but thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Christensen. I'm the Curator of Education and Statewide Engagement at the University of Wyoming Art Museum. And this is the Lunch Hour Conversations with Curators. It is part of our Conversations Beyond the Walls, a virtual symposium. Um, and our special guests today are Andrea Graham, wave Andrea and say hello, and Stan Honda, wave Stan and say hello, great. So the symposium is a project that originated from the American Studies Program and the UW Art Museum and is a series of talks, presentations, and art activations held in conjunction with the exhibition that is on loan from the Heart, Wyoming, Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. Um, if you are in Laramie, the museum is open and you can come see it in person uh, Tuesday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Today we're going to be viewing it virtually, so if you're just joining us, you should be able to see the video on the screen with my colleague Rachel Cook in the gallery. So the goal of this series is to honor the history of Japanese American peoples incarcerated by the, by the US government in Wyoming and beyond during World War II, and to integrate the arts with the complex cultural issues. In doing so, we hope to use an historical event to address contemporary narratives such as global human migration, displacement of peoples, power and control, empathy and belonging, homesteading, resiliency, diversity, and the social justice issues of today. So before we begin, I, I feel compelled to acknowledge that in, in Laramie, at least where I am, we are currently occupying the indigenous ancestral land of the Arapaho, Shoshone, Cheyenne, and Crow people, among other native tribes that call the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain regions home. In doing so, we hope this event we affirm the autonomy and well-being of indigenous peoples and that must remain central to all efforts towards justice and equity. So again, today's discussion will be recorded. We hope it's interactive. Um, you have the ability as participants to mute and unmute yourselves today. We ask if you're not speaking, you remain on mute. And then if you have a question, there will be time for questions at the end. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in. Know that you can also toggle back and forth between speaker view and gallery view. Speaker view will just focus on the speaker. Gallery view will kind of do the Brady Bunch grid where you can see everyone. Right now I have the video in our gallery space pinned. So I think you'll be able to see that right now. If you need closed captioning for the event, um, you can go to the link that is posted in the chat and access closed captioning that way. Uh, let's see, there are more folks joining us, so thank you for joining us today. We're gonna start with a presentation of the Sway and Andrea is gonna talk a little bit about how this project came to be and the history of the project itself. So I'm gonna turn it over and let Andrea chime in here. So go ahead, Andrea. Um, I think we'll pause the video in the gallery space and switch over to the Sway exhibition. So take me just a second to do that but chime in when you're ready. Okay, well, um, I'm a folklorist and I work in the American Studies program at the university as primarily as a researcher and public programmer. And uh, when I first came to Wyoming in 2009, I was doing field work up in the Bighorn Basin and that's when I first encountered the Heart Mountain site. The Interpreter Center wasn't there yet. Um, but I walked around and looked at the information and I had, I grew up back east and really never learned anything about the Japanese American concentration camps at all. But when I moved out west, I had done some work in the west desert of Utah where the Topaz camp is. I also lived in Idaho for a while and did work in the south central region where the Minidoka was. So I had become familiar with 
this whole story of the camps. Um, and then um, shortly after I started, um, Eric Sandine, who was the director of the American Studies program, had been working with the Heart Mountain, um, the group trying to get organized and develop a museum. And so he had come up with a project to locate and document the barracks that had been moved and reused by homesteaders up in the Bighorn Basin. So I got involved in that, in that project. And so we did a bunch of field trip over trips over several years. We had students involved. We had field classes, just asking around and locating some of these buildings that had been reused and hearing the stories of the homesteaders. And this was done in, in um, partnership with the Homesteader Museum in Powell. And so in 2012, I believe, um, they produced an exhibit based on our research with some of the historic photos and contemporary photos of these barrack buildings. That exhibit is now um, on the UW campus in the library. It's on display in the library for the month of October. So anyone who's in town here can go look at that exhibit. Um, and then I was up back up in the area three years ago. I was just looking at my field notes to get ready for some of these presentations. And I saw in fall of 2017, I was up visited the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center and Stan's exhibit was on display there. So that's the first I saw it. And I said, these are just wonderful photos and it's a different take from our exhibit, which is very historical and documentary. This is an artistic eye looking at the same landscape. And I just thought it was a wonderful exhibit. So I talked immediately, went and talked to Dakota Russell, the director and said, we would love to get this exhibit down to Laramie, to the university for, for people to see it. And he said, we would love to work with you on it. So it took a while. It's obviously taken three years. Um, tried finding spaces on campus. The art museum seemed the logical space, sort of made a proposal. And at the time they didn't, the calendar and the space didn't work out and they just said, we're not gonna be able to do this. So I had kind of given up, but then I was talking to Katie and Rachel. We were part of another event and somehow this subject came up and I said, there's this exhibit that I would love to have. And Rachel said, well, because I would like my class, I teach a class in public sector work. And uh, she said, maybe we could put it in the teaching gallery. I said, oh, that would be a great idea. And then we got thinking about it and looking at it and it would be, it would only get one wall in the teaching gallery and that just was not gonna be enough. So with some more shuffling and planning at the museum, I'm not sure how it happened, but Katie, <laughs> Katie and Rachel made it happen that we got a gallery for this exhibit and worked with the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center to bring it down here. And uh, that's how it got here. And then, then we wanted to plan a symposium to go with it because we said there's so many issues, both historic and contemporary, that this whole concept of the barracks and the camp bring up and we want to discuss it. We want to bring in Stan. We want to bring in Sharon Yamato who made a film about moving walls. So we were all excited and got this all planned. It was supposed to happen this month. And then by late this spring, we realized it was not going to happen in person. So we totally shifted gears and turned it into a virtual month long symposium with this whole series of events. So I think it's, it's going to be great. We're really sad that Stan can't be here in person to walk us around the gallery and talk about his work, but this is, this is the next best thing. And so we're really, really pleased that you could join us, Stan, and, and uh, really looking forward to hearing about the stories of this documentation process and, and your work in general as a photographer. So welcome. That's great. Thanks, Andrea. That's such a good reminder. Sometimes we in the museum world forget that um, there's so much behind the scenes work that goes into putting an exhibition together. And our schedule at the museum is often booked out for three years or more. So it has taken a long time for this to come to fruition here in Laramie anyway. So Stan, please go ahead and take it away. I just wanted to interject quickly in the chat. I've posted a link to the digital exhibition um, called Asway. I was sharing it and I had a little technical difficulty. So I'm going to start over with that. But if you want to view it on your own screen, please go ahead and do that. And let's see. Can I get somebody to just say, yay, we see the sway now. 
Yep. Looks good, Katie. Awesome. Great. Well, take it away, Stan. Thank you. Thank you for being here, too. Well, thanks. I wish I could be in the gallery in, in person. I know that was the original plan, so it's too bad that we, Sharon and I can't come out and, and visit Laramie. And thanks, Andrea and Katie and Rachel uh, for getting, uh, putting that all together and getting the exhibit uh, in the gallery. It's definitely worth seeing the, the photos in person if you can make it to Laramie. Uh, and uh, this, this sway presentation though is pretty remarkable. The, re the reproduction of the, of the images is, I think, very good, very high quality. So uh, it's almost like you're there uh, viewing the exhibit. Um, the, our, our project for this book and the DVD, it actually goes back over 20 years. Um, originally in 1994, the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles uh, created a project to, uh, to try to uh, restore two of the original barracks. And uh, through the efforts of some volunteers at the museum, they, they found two barracks in Wyoming that were part of the, the, the um, camp called Heart Mountain. The official name was the Heart Mountain Relocation Center. And essentially, it was a concentration camp for uh, Japanese Americans and Japanese during, during World War II. Uh, they were held essentially prisoner in, in this compound and, uh, and were not allowed to leave, were not, uh, could not leave, and was, it was surrounded by barbed wire and our army soldiers. Um, and so the uh, museum in Los Angeles, they uh, did this project uh, to try to restore two of the barracks. Their idea was uh, a group of volunteers would go to Wyoming uh, they would essentially de deconstruct the, each of the barracks and they would reconstruct one of them back in Los Angeles uh, for a, a, a show, an exhibition at the museum. And so uh, I saw a little notice in the uh, newsletter for the Japanese American National Museum and it said that they were looking for volunteers to work on this project. And I, for, to me, um, uh, it, it sort of involves well, both American history, I think as Andrea was talking about, uh, but also uh, personal family history. Uh, both of my parents uh, and their families were uh, were rounded up and incarcerated during World War II, and so they told they would tell us of, of their experiences uh, during the war in the, in these camps. Uh, and so I thought that this was really a project that really needed to be documented. My background is uh, as a photojournalist. I spent most of my career. Uh, in newspaper and wire service work. Um, and so, and now I'm doing independent projects. Uh, and one of the projects I was able to do uh, uh, is this, the project about the barracks, the Moving Walls book uh, and the DVD that Sharon worked on. Um, so my wife and I went to Wyoming in, uh, I think it was around in, in August of 1994 and met up with this group of volunteers that was, they were disassembling uh, one of the two, two barracks. It was a great project. They had a uh, architectural uh, a preservationist who his, his specialty was disassembling old buildings and then putting them back together. Uh, so he was a perfect person for this project. And also working on the project was a writer from Los Angeles named Sharon Yamato. And we were talking about how she was writing, going to be writing articles for some of the newspapers in California. And, and could she submit my photos along with her stories? And I said, sure. Um, about a month after the Wyoming part of the project, uh, everybody and, and more volunteers gathered in, in Los Angeles in the parking lot of the Japanese American National Museum to reconstruct one of the barracks that they uh, were able to preserve from Wyoming. Uh, so that was an amazing sight, I think, to see this, this barrack being put back together. Uh, in in the parking lot of the of the museum. So I I, I flew to San Diego. I'm based in New York City, and um, uh, I flew to San Diego to pick up my father, who was really interested in this whole idea of the barracks. And we drove up to Los Angeles uh, to watch this whole process going through. And so uh, to him, it was it was kind of fascinating, and I'm sure brought back lots of memories of the barrack that he was in in the in the Arizona camp called Poston. Um, so the, uh, at, the, at the time, and then Los Angeles, Sharon said she wanted, she was thinking about expanding her writings into a, a book project, and could she, could she use the, could she use the photos? And, uh, and I said, sure. 
that would be that, that would be great. And so we published a book in 1995 uh, called Moving Walls, uh, Preserving the Barracks of America's Concentration Camp. And that was the, the very first project that, that we did. Uh, and in uh, 2015, Sharon called me. Since then, we had been working on lots of different projects with the museum, um, uh, specifically on the Japanese American incarceration. Um, and in 2015, she called and said, I'm, I'm applying for a grant. The, uh, there's a grant program called the Japanese American Confinement Sites and it's run by the National Park Service. And they give out grants to uh, essentially educational projects, museums, galleries, to do work about the Japanese American in incarceration. Uh, she said she's applying for one of these grants to expand the book and possibly do a, a video DVD. And would I be interested in working on it? And I, it didn't take much time for me to say, well, yes, of course, I'd really be interested. So she put together a plan, and, and then we ended up back in Wyoming, in northern Wyoming, up near uh, between Cody and Powell, looking for these barracks. Uh, we, uh, the idea was to try to find out what happened to the barracks after the war, because Heart Mountain was one of the few camps where uh, barracks actually still exist uh, from the 1940s. And it, it, what happened in Heart Mountain was that there was a, a, a homesteading project in, in this general area where the mountain called Heart Mountain is uh, in, in that northern part of Wyoming. And uh, so the, what, the returning veterans from, from, um, from the war uh, could apply for a lottery and if their names were drawn, they were given uh, land, I think anywhere between uh, 100 to 200 acres of, of land. And, and then the Shoshone River was di diverted into uh, a, uh, um, an agricultural pro uh, project so that the, the, uh, the land could be irrigated. Uh, and so uh, uh, all, of the, all of the homesteaders, the men uh, who were the homesteaders were all veterans from the war and uh, the land that the barracks were on was uh, uh, government owned land. So during the uh, the homesteading project, they they essentially were the owners of the barrack, and and they, they were able to sell the barracks uh, for a dollar each to the homesteaders, because um, the homesteaders were given land, um, and that was pretty much it. Uh, there, there was no running water, no electricity, no services, no no structures. So they needed uh, at least some place to live, and also structures for outbuildings and storage. So they often would buy two. And, and then uh, uh, there were trucking services that was able to take the barracks uh, to the to the land that they uh, that they were they, they were given. Um, and so uh, I think Sharon managed to find several uh, of the homesteaders who were still still alive. Of course, uh, like my parents' generation, it's it's people who were uh, young during the war years, and their their that generation is dying off now. So we, we found a fair number of homesteaders. They invited us into their homes and, 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 and we interviewed them there. And uh, many, it turns out many of the homesteaders uh, had, con had turned their, the barrack, one of the barracks that they got into their house and that became the home that we saw in the present day. The, uh, obviously there were a huge number of changes that they added on. They, they essentially made it into what uh, is, called a ranch style house. The, the photo on the screen right now is kind of a typical example. Um, although the, the Rauch Fuchs is here, they added on a lot of stone around the, the base of the walls, but generally the, you saw a, a basic ranch house, ranch style house um, on either side of the, the main highway uh, between Cody and Powell. Uh, so we were able to interview a, a, a lot of the homesteaders and, and also did some, um, on the second trip out, a, a videographer from the museum came out to do the video portion, uh, interviewing the homesteaders, and we went to a, an annual pilgrimage that the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center does. Uh, it's the Interpretive Center, it's an excellent museum that is on the site of the original camp, uh, which is between Cody and Powell, just off of the route, I think it's called Alternate 14, and it, uh, which goes between the two towns. Uh, and so the uh, 
museum and they they found a barrack in a near a town called Shell, Wyoming, and they were able to bring that back to the site. So the 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 museum not only does it have artifacts displays about the, the camp itself called Heart Mountain, but there's a barrack that you could I think you could walk in a portion of it and you could uh, see the scale of the barrack, what it was like to be in to be inside and. Uh, to me, it was just interesting to meet with the, uh, the former homesteaders, with a lot of the survivors, Japanese American survivors of the camp at, uh, at the Heart Mountain uh, pilgrimage later in the year. And then the, I think to do an extended project uh, is uh, work, worked really well. Uh, Sharon spent almost a month on the first trip in Wyoming, and uh, I, I spent about almost three weeks there going around and photographing. We'd, uh, we'd kind of structure our day to try to do uh, one or two interviews and also uh, fi finding the actual barracks. Uh, there were, there was, we got a little tour from a, a few people who knew uh, that a lot of which buildings were actual barracks. Uh, and so that was very instructional because we were able to, after a while, after we saw some um, of the barracks that were used as storage or outbuildings and, and had not been changed very much since the war, you got an idea of the proportions of the, of the roof and the walls and the structure. And then we would see a house that would look very similar to that uh, and then guess that that was a, a, possibly a, a former barrack. And as it turns out, a lot, a lot of them are. And so that was really interesting. The, um, one of the one of my favorite pictures is the one that's on the screen now is uh, uh, the another project that I do uh, that I've been working on uh, it has been uh, night sky photography night sky landscapes and the the sky uh, in Wyoming and that part of Wyoming is very clear and you can see a, a ton of stars at night so I went out at night uh, a few times to try to photo photograph some of the remnants of the barracks uh, under the stars and and it, it worked out fairly well, but our, the weather at that time that we were there wasn't the greatest, but I managed to find a couple of clear nights. And, and so that worked out, worked out uh, fairly good. So it sort of tr was trying to uh, combine the things that I've learned from one project with this, with this barracks project. Um, and the, uh, let's see, Sharon uh, is, does a lot of work as an independent filmmaker. So she was, she would be, uh, essentially working on the film and writing the book at the same time. Uh, the, books, the book is a really fascinating book because uh, uh, it, it combines a little bit of the very first edition that we did uh, along with the second that talks a little bit more about the homesteaders, the, the reaction of people in Wyoming and what, what happened to the barracks uh, after, the, after the camps. And in, um, uh, for Sharon, it was a very, uh, very personal writing because her her parents didn't talk at all about their experiences in the camp. So she really never learned firsthand what it was like uh, to, to be in the camps from her family. Uh, she would talk to a lot of the people uh, who were on the original volunteer project in 1994, and then also people who we met, who met up, uh, 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 on this um, uh, second edition that we were working on. Uh, Japanese Americans that would talk about their experiences and so she felt she, she was learning a lot about what her parents and what her older brothers and sisters had lived through during during the war. Uh, so I recommend the book uh, just to to get an idea of, of uh, how Sharon's viewpoint of, 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 the, of the project and the, and the people that we were talking with. Um, in the uh, as we were going on with the project we had been doing a lot of work with the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center and, and, and the, the great folks that work there. And one thing that came up was the possibility of doing an exhibit of the, of the still photos, and because that would help publicize the book and our project, but also help uh, the, the Interpretive Center uh, see a more different viewpoint, a more artistic viewpoint of uh, what the, the, the uh, the education that they tried to get across. And so that came together pretty well. I, I had the prints made and the, the Danielle at the Interpretive Center did the, did the framing. Um, I think um, 
up in Montana and the, the, the frames, as you might be able to see some from of the gallery photos, really match, I think really match the photos and kind of the general feeling of the exhibit pretty well. Uh, so if you are in Laramie or if you're near Laramie, it's, it's, I think it's worth it to, to go to the gallery, go to the museum to see the, see, see the exhibit in person. Um, and so, so I thought that the, the, uh, the framing and the display of the, uh, of the photos in the, in the first exhibit at the Interpretive Center and then the subsequent exhibits turned out, turned out pretty well. Um, let's see. Uh, so in, in uh, let's see, uh, about, a, uh, about two year, about a year and a half after we finished doing the research, uh, Sharon had finished the writing and we went through a process with a, a very good designer who designed the very first book and, uh, about kind of putting, putting things in, in the second book. And uh, that process all, all worked out. And I, th I think toward the, uh, toward the end of 2017, we had, a, we had a finished book. It was kind of exciting to see the actual book itself, to hold, to hold the book. For the for the exhibit, the ones that you, the the uh, photos that you saw in the sway and the and the one that Rachel was showing uh, in the live live view of the gallery, I, I I wanted to present everything in black and white. I thought that was um, the, the the color tends to kind of distract sometimes from looking at the actual subject matter of the photos. So the I talked to a printer that I work with, and he said that the black and whites would would print up pretty well and. I think they did, and I, th I think it kind of allows you to look more at the people in the photo, at the subject matter in the photo, and, uh, and be less distracted by uh, any color in that, that's in the scene. The pictures in the book are kind of mixed black and white in color. Uh, originally, I, I wanted to have all of them in black and white because the, the fir first book was in black and white because I, I shot it in black and white on black and white film back in the days when we had film. Uh, and then also the, uh, Sharon had a fair number of historical pictures from the period that are, that are all black and white. So everything, everything tended to match, match up pretty well. Um, but, the, but I thought that, that the second edition of the book, uh, turn, turn, I think, uh, turned out well just in terms of, of how it looks and how, how the design went. Um, and then Sharon's DVD also covers uh, sim similar ground, talking with, interviewing with the people that you see in the book. Uh, and with, with a lot of historical background from people uh, that work at the Interpretive Center, uh, and also I think a few people from the University of Wyoming. So, so, so that's, that's definitely worth seeing, and um, I think definitely look worth uh, coming, I think in about a week we're going to do the screening of the, of the film in, on, one, on one of these programs. Uh, let's see. Um, I guess I could take and, Katie. I think I I could take a few uh, take some questions now. Or, sure. Or, yeah, and I was just going to chime in and remind folks that our Thursday night speaker series tomorrow is featuring Andrea Graham and a few other folks. You mentioned Sam that there's um, specific features of the barracks that help us recognize some of those things and architectural elements like the nine windows across the top and the five pane door. Um, Andrea, do you want to chime in uh, without giving too much away? Our, our talk tomorrow night is going to kind of dive into that a little bit more. Do you want to chime in a little bit about those types of things, Andrea, and some of your experience also? Um, yeah, as Stan said, once you spend time out there, and once you've seen some of the buildings that we know are barracks, you get an eye for the proportions, the angle of the roof, some of them still, outbuildings, will still have the doors and their nine pane windows and doors that have five panels that are very distinctive. Most of the houses don't have those anymore, um, but sometimes you'll find an outbuilding and then talk to the people there and you'll find out the house also was a barrack. So we just, we kind of um, learned what to look for and uh, we'll be talking about that tomorrow. I saw that Mary Homestone was on this call earlier um, she's an architectural historian, a historic preservationist. She's going to talk tomorrow and show lots of photos about some of the, the telltale elements on, on a barrack that you can still see today. So that was part, you know, it's a lot of detective work. And then everyone we talked to, we asked, do you know other people who have these barracks? And pretty much every homestead along that road between Cody and Powell 
had barracks. I mean, that's how they, that's how they built their farms and ranches. So we're right. going to go into a lot more detail tomorrow about our research process and some of the stories that we heard. That, that would be great. The, the other thing that went during the whole project, uh, uh, the, the one thing I was thinking about is that uh, the barrack is the one artifact that is common among uh, all of the Japanese Americans that were incarcerated, that each, a lot of the, each of the 10 camps were different and they all went different climates, uh, different kinds of experiences, but everybody was forced to live in a barrack. And so everybody had a barrack story. And uh, because the, the camps were constructed by the US government and ma mainly the, uh, the, with the help of the army, everything was standardized because they, they, they wouldn't have been able to build anything on a massive scale like that if it wasn't standardized. So uh, the pattern of the, of the barracks used in these camps is similar to barracks at, at an army base during World War II. And it was constructed very quickly and fairly, fairly shoddy construction. But everybody had a barrack story. And uh, my father had barrack stories about what his barrack was like, uh, what the windows were like, which weren't exactly the same as the Heart Mountain one, because his, his barrack was in Arizona in Poston. So there were the kind of minor differences. But then it's, the, it's really the one artifact, I think, that, that people have in, in common. And, and so, it, uh, the people's, the survivors' experiences when they see a barrack, I think, is to bring back these memories of what it was like to 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 be to be forced to be to live in in something like that. And and so so um, the, the barrack really is it's becomes a very symbolic uh, item that's that's part of the whole history of of the Japanese American experience. And, and more of the of all the camps, more barracks were preserved here because of the homesteading. Mm -hmm. The homesteaders needed buildings, and so they were able to buy the barracks. And a lot of other places, they were torn down for lumber or burned, or I don't know, but not as nearly as many were preserved. Some they are. I know in Delta, Utah, which is very close to the Topaz camp, there are some houses that were barracks, and they have a their website has a driving tour where you, can, where you can find them, but it's not nearly as many as were preserved here in the Bighorn Basin. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things for me is um, Stan's layer of night sky photography on a lot of the images has a hopeful element to it. And I say that because April French just turned her video on. And I think because the barracks in Wyoming have that homesteader element, they have a secondary story to it. April, do you want to chime in a little bit? Were you going to ask a question or give some context? I, I offer it up to you. <laughs> Yes, uh, my name is April French and um, I'm the granddaughter and great niece of some homesteaders um, in the Heart Mountain Project. Uh, I actually, Stan, I know some of your subjects. Um, as I walked into the exhibit, I was like, oh, I <laughs> just took my breath away. I know these people. Um, Takogawa is was one of the dearest people in my life as a, as a child. So um, he and his wife, Emmy, were just precious um, people. And I know the Spearings very well as well. So, um, but yeah, um, I actually have a very brief section from my grandfather's memoir that he wrote in 1994 about his life in the barracks um, early on. And I'd be happy to share it, but I don't want to um, take up too much time if, if um, you all are open to hear it. Yes? Yeah, I think go ahead, okay. April. Okay, so um, this is his, I'm going to try to retain his voice as much as possible, but uh, we learned in the fall of 48 that um, Heart Mountain Unit 104 might be up for contest. Basically, the first homesteader didn't, didn't, um, what's the word? Solve his land. Um, and um, so he filed his papers. I was notified in April that I got the homestead and was asked to be in Powell May 15th. Um, he talks about, you know, getting um, approval and then 
it was too late to get a crop in in May. So in September, after the beans were out in Colorado, where he, he was in Northern Colorado, I came up and got my barracks moved out from Hart Mountain Camp and established residence. Now, he didn't talk about this, but it was quite the ordeal to move those barracks, <laughs> as you might imagine. I had to have a house ready to live in by November of 49. We got all three sections of barracks out of the Hart Mountain Camp moved out. I tore down the fourth section in camp and hauled it out in my brother-in-law's pickup. I borrowed a tractor and corrugator, a ditcher. I irrigated 60 acres. In November, after beet harvest in Colorado, I hauled up some machinery and plowed that 60 acres. We spent the winter in Colorado. Um, he talks a little bit about the birth of my father. Um, we moved into one of those cold old barracks. I had to build a room inside of a room as the oil heater would not keep us warm. Um, our daughter was three and a half, our son was one month old. It was so cold that a wet wash rag dropped on the floor um, would, would be froze to the floor in a matter of minutes. It finally warmed up and we were on our way. In the fall of 1950, I took a 40 foot section of barracks and moved it back to the west edge of the yard. I remodeled it and insulated it with pretty wallpaper fastened to the vertex walls by colored thumbtacks, we had a cozy little home. We got electricity in November of 51. That sure was nice after doing without it for two years. The worst part was doing without a refrigerator. In the fall of 1952, we got a loan from FHA to build a new house. We felt that we could not stay here without a better house. I had torn down two 60 foot barrack buildings and cleaned all the nails out of the lumber. All that went into the house. We had a cement party. A lot of my good neighbors came and helped us pour the foundations and the footings. We moved into the house in May of 1953. By the grace of God, we are still here. We've always enjoyed this house. So I thought I'd just share that with you all in terms of the story, kind of the living story of the barracks after the war and, and how um, there is, as Stan mentioned, and I think Andrea as well, Kind of that shared it's not only it's an artifact for the japanese americans for sure and then it's interesting how then it intersects with these world war ii veterans and they had similar experiences but were not incarcerated they they moved there by choice so um you see the complex layering of that i think the one interesting thing that we were thinking about as people were showing us their homes, is that in in the walls, in these people's walls, was is a barrack. Uh, it, it's the wood is still there. I mean, the barrack is sort of still there, and it's a, it it became an interesting way to think about how this structure is being um, almost preserved in in history. And if a lot, of, especially a lot of the children and the younger generation, were interested in the history, and I think some would do research into the the, the camp and and the homesteading projects. So the the barrack itself be, be, became a starting point for a lot of different ways that the people could, could think about the, the the camp and the area and the things like the homesteading project. April, your story reminded me of the photo of the nails in uh, a hand stand. Do you want to talk a little bit about that image in particular? And I'll see if I can pull it up. Well, April, it's it's it's. Um, I don't think it's amazing because that's what people did back then. They 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 would take apart a building, they would save the wood and and the nails because you couldn't just go out. Most people couldn't afford and go out and just buy a whole bunch of nails to put together a house. You you used everything that you could reclaim from something, and so so that's 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 just what what people did um, to to give people an idea of the perspective. Um, the, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go mention the nails first that um, on the, uh, there was a young couple that had, that had bought a farm and there was part of a barrack on their, on the farm that they used for, uh, at, at the time we visited them, there were some sheep in there. So they're made for some amazingly cute photos of the, <laughs> of the sheep, but um, they were very interested in the, in the history. And when they found out it was a barrack, they really wanted, it, part of it was um, they had to, tear down be, because it was just collapsing under, under the age, but they wanted to preserve as much of it as possible. And they had found a lot of the square nails on their 
um, just around in the dirt after they had taken down the part that was that was falling down, and they realized that that was these are the old nails. And in the 1940s, na nails were often square in shape, and 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 so we they knew that those were older, and so they they gave Sharon a handful of the nails. Um, which uh, which we photographed in her in her hand. You could you could see the the square shape of these nails, and so it was interesting to see uh, the something like this uh, just historically right right below our feet. I mean, literally below our feet in the ground uh, were these nails. Um, the other thing April was talking about is is about moving. The barrack. Uh, I, I think uh, in in some of these some of the photos we we found a barrack, uh, an, an intact barrack that hadn't been altered uh, at all, and the full barrack was 120 feet long and 20 feet wide, and and that often held as many as as four separate family units. So you could do the math and figure out how little space people had uh, in in the camp. Uh, but at in it, it I, I I think we found out that. During the uh, late 40s, the longest flatbed truck available was 60 feet, and so you couldn't move a 120-foot barrack on a truck. And you had to cut it in half, at least in half, and sometimes in thirds. So mm -hmm. the the lengths that people often talk about, which April just mentioned, was 60 feet or 40 feet, because if you cut it in thirds, you could have 40-foot lengths, or if you cut it in half, it's 60-foot lengths. Um, we had talked to one of the homesteaders, and he said, "Oh yeah, we cut the barrack in half, to, so we had to move it." So we, we said, how, "How did you, how did you cut it in half?" And he, and he said, "With a saw." And right, yeah, April's doing the saw, and so uh, and we said, with, "With a saw?" He said, "Yeah, you just start at the top and you go to the bottom, and then you do the other side." And uh, we said, "Well, how long did that take?" And he said, "Oh, it took a couple of days." And, and, <laughs> Uh, Sharon had done a lot of research with, with the, the, the water uh, district archives because uh, they became the agency that uh, uh, inherited, I think, a lot of historical archives from the, um, the homesteading and reclamation project. And she found some pictures of a guy on a ladder on the roof saw, sawing through the roof. And on his way down, on his way to the, the wall, and he, he was just going to keep on going until he saw the, the one half of the barracks. So, so we had pretty good evidence that, that people did just get up, st started from the roof, and, and sawed the barrack in half. <laughs> and then, that's, then, then they were able to move the, uh, each half se uh, separately to, the, to their land. And we've got yeah. our presentation tomorrow. Um, we've got several of those. We've got lots of historic photos of barracks on trucks being moved and the guy sawing it in half. So if you want to hear more about the details of how that physically happened, join us tomorrow at seven for our presentation. Andrea, were there any images of barracks being moved by moving logs, like logs under the, the building and because my great aunt tells, well, tells, told stories about having to move their barracks that way. And of course they were up that hill. So they were, they were, they were some of the first homesteaders and I think they had to move with logs. So they'd have to run and it was like a multi-person task and multi-day task to move these barracks sometimes. Wow, I haven't seen any photos like that. There are lots of them on being pulled by trucks. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing is a lot of the homesteaders say they, they got their land in this lottery and they came up to the Bighorn Basin, most of them were from other places, and they had to get their land ready and get the irrigation in, so they lived in the barracks at the campsite until their land was ready and until the buildings could be cut and moved. So they were living in the same camp, in the same place where the Japanese Americans had been living. That, yes. just, that image is just... I was amazed when shared I shared bathrooms, that. shared mess halls. Um, yeah, yeah. The hardships that the Japanese had had gone through. Are there any other folks that have questions for Stan? That, that this is a great opportunity to ask anything. There's nothing off limits at this point, um, and so it's an opportunity just to get some questions answered since we're here and it's a not a webinar we have direct access that's kind of the beauty of this format
Dan, I had, I had a question about what you think the night sky photography adds to the content of the exhibition. It's really historically rooted, but there's something really beautiful about adding the night sky to some of those images. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience of kind of marrying the night sky imagery with the historical aspect of this project? Sure. Um, in the, the time that we were doing the project in Wyoming, um, uh, I had been doing the night sky work for um, at least three or four years. Uh, and, I, and I thought it would be a good chance to, to try this and to see how it works. Uh, you see the barracks in different kinds of environments or, or different kinds of, mainly during the daytime. And I thought this would be a good chance to, to see what it looks like at night. Uh, uh, because the, the, at, at night in one of these camps, it must have just been a, a very strange place. Uh, people were uprooted from um, mostly the, the, the west coast of, of the country, and now they're inland in a, in a, in a very strange environment, strange sounds, very, uh, what, uh, very harsh weather, especially during the winter. Uh, in, in, in Wyoming, and so the, uh, I think to be able to show show the barrack uh, under the sky, under this really great sky that that you could see in Wyoming, uh, you, uh, we I can't see that uh, sky like that from where I live in New York City uh, because of all the light pollution. Um, so so I think it was it was kind of nice to show the buildings in in context. With it, with a, at least a different time of environment, when the when the Earth is in shadow, when the when the when the stars are visible, the, the rest the rest of the our solar system and the rest of the our universe is is visible out from the uh, away from the glare of the of the sunlight and and like I said, I, those are some of my favorite photos uh, in the book. Thank you. I, they're some of mine too. <laughs> Any questions from anyone else in the audience, feel free to chime in. You can also type your question in the chat and I'm happy to read it for you. Um, and while people are doing that, I, oh, here we go. Kat had a question. Yeah. What was the farthest one of these photographed buildings traveled from Heart Mountain? And I'll let Andrea or Stan answer that one. I think most of the ones Stan photographed were in the, in the area. Although that one that was moved back to the interpretive center was in Shell, which is, I don't know how far, but it's the other side of the Bighorn Basin. We right. documented one in Thermopolis, which is a hundred miles away. I know that there were some that went as far as Riverton and Pavilion. So that's, you know, through the canyon, they must have taken it apart because the building would not fit through the tunnels in the Wind River Canyon. I think there's supposed to be some on the Wind River Reservation. So, several hundred miles. They, some of them went a long, long way. Yeah, yeah, we did hear that, that, that there, there, there are a few spread out in different, especially toward the south, uh, central and southern part of Wyoming, which, which you're right, it's, that's a long ways to go with, a, with even part of a barrack, I would think. And the barrack that was the original project is now in the Japanese American National Muse Museum in LA, right, Stan? Yes, uh, what they did was they, they initially had constructed the barrack, which was a, a half of one, a 60 foot portion. Uh, and then they, with new material, they created the, the remaining 60 feet. So to give you an idea how big a, uh, an original barrack was. And for the permanent exhibit, which is inside the museum now, uh, they, they took, I think, two walls from, from that barrack and reconstructed it inside the museum so that as you go into this, this small gallery, uh, there's, there's a, I think, two, two or three walls that you could walk into. And so you can walk into the corner of the barrack and maybe get an idea of, of how, at least how wide it was, how, how tall it was, a little bit of the unfinished ceiling that that would exist in, in, in a barrack. And then, then they had uh, exhibits uh, and photographs on, on the, uh, in the display talking about the barrack and the barracks project. So if anyone is in the LA area, take a minute to go to the Japanese American National Museum. It's a great museum. And you can see one of the Heart Mountain or a portion of the Heart Mountain barrack there. 
Another question, what was the response of former Japanese concentrated in Wyoming regarding the beautiful skies in the photographs? Oh, let's see. Uh, you mean, I guess a response to the night sky photos. Uh, I, I think people, people generally responded pretty well because I, it's a kind of a picture that you don't really see too often. And I think especially in the context of, of a project like this, historic, dealing with historical uh, objects, uh, historical artifacts, or uh, with, a, with a topic like this, with the incarceration of, of a group of people. Uh, and, and so I, I think they, they were, people were kind of surprised and I think they were, uh, they were interested in, in um, I guess, how I, how I did that, how I, how I photographed the, uh, the barracks at night. Uh, but because uh, I had, had done a few other pictures around the interpretive center because the, uh, there's a few other portions of the camp that, that still exist uh, uh, up on the ridge from the interpretive center. So I, I photographed around there at night uh, and they were they, there. Uh, uh, there's a chimney and part of a brick structure that still exists. So I, I did some pictures of that and I think people were just really interested in, in the fact that you could photograph it at night there and then just the, the blending of the sky and, and the uh, things like the barrack and uh, the, the portions of the, of the camp in, uh, in Wyoming. Yeah, and, and for me, I think the sky um, gives us the opportunity and almost the space for these two stories to almost come together and all be heard almost because I think one group's experience was that of struggle and oppression and the other group I think we think we hear about like tenacity and so the the sky is almost this space for both of those stories to be heard and the building allows for both of those stories to be heard in in many ways for me anyway. Yeah. Um, I, we have one last question and it's what are the technical aspects of night sky photography? Oh, well, the technical parts of it are, for, uh, at least as a, as a photographer, as a former photojournalist, I'm, I'm, I was used to working extremely fast uh, because the things like new, news stories and sports, uh, the subjects are moving fast. With at, at night, the exposures are very long, sometimes uh, 10 to 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, and I, I need a tripod, so it's so it's a very very slow process, slower even slower than a lot of landscape photography, uh, be, because of the longer exposures. And so it, it it was an interesting transition to go from working very fast to working extremely slow, and 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 then so each of the pictures uh, often takes several minutes to e even a half hour or an hour just to complete, just to to get the right composition, the right exposure, and. Uh, there are lots of things like airplanes in the sky that that um, I, oftentimes I don't want in the, in the photos. So uh, it, it's a very to me it's a very it's kind of a slow and meditative process uh, that that kind of adds to the the, uh, the interest in in the photo itself. That's awesome and and sort of a beautiful metaphor in the process itself as well. Uh, I just want to read a comment from Kat that she says the Wyoming sky always makes me feel free and hopeful. It is so powerful in the juxtaposition. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Elizabeth, did you have one last question? You're our, our winner for the last question of the day. This just brought to mind a photograph. Can you see? No, it's not showing. There it is. Um, okay. I got just a while ago. And um, it's, it's taken in the Olympic National Park up in, I live in Oregon, up in Washington, but it's uh, the Milky Way. And then the quote at the bottom is by John Muir, and it says, we all travel the Milky Way together. And so that we talked about the, the combinations of the two different stories here. And so um, I just really like that photo. I didn't expect to see other night photos. So this has been very good. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. It's great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you all for joining us. I just happened to notice that uh, our 
other special guest just hopped on. Sharon Yamato has been mentioned several times. She's Stan's collaborator, um, and she had another obligation today, but she was just able to join us. So I just wanted to acknowledge Sharon. Her video's off, but hi, Sharon. Thank you for being here. Thank you to all of our special guests today. Um, and I'll be mindful of the time. I know we try to keep these things right in our, our lunch hour space. Um, if people want to hang out just a few minutes after and chat, that's great. But I'll just uh, end by saying thank you so much to Stan and Andrea for sharing your wisdom today. Thank you for our special guests. Um, thanks for everyone in the audience for joining as well. And if you'd like to register for upcoming uh, speaker series, they're basically every night in October. I've placed a link in the chat. You can go ahead and register. Um, thank you all and have a wonderful day. I'll hang out for a little while and if Sharon wants to pop in and say anything, she's welcome to do so or if anyone else has questions. Otherwise, take good care of yourselves. Thanks, Kate. And uh, next week on Thursday, the film, Stan, Stan will be back with Sharon and they'll be showing the film that Stan talked about which is wonderful. It's good to see so many folks from all the way across the country, Oregon, New York, Massachusetts. Hi, Margarita, <laughs> right here in Laramie.